The job of the production designer, just like any sort of aspect of the filmmaking process, always begins with a text. And so from there is where we launch the whole art department. And what that means, just like for an actor who creates a character that an audience believe in, the job of the art department is to create worlds and environments that the audience believe in. And hopefully through long processes, whereby we involve obviously construction, paint, plaster, set decoration, we complete a world that is in a sense completely real within the world of Game of Thrones. And I think where Game of Thrones actually needs a lot of credit is actually we really try and keep a lot of scenes in camera. So for as much as possible, we create total environments. I mean, it's an extraordinary thing to be able to build a 360 degree space. On every level, we try and be very thoughtful and mindful of the colours that relate to the character involved, their status in society, and what do we want an audience to know about them as they're moving through the landscape. We were looking at the world of Dawn and the Spanish and Moorish influence. The exciting thing about Dawn is it's the warmest of the climates that we visit. It's also incredibly exotic. And so I think it was a real opportunity for us to introduce colour into the world as well. You know, these people are much more into sort of oranges and blues, and there's a real vibrancy and energy about the city or about the place. And so Seville in Spain was the natural place for us to start. And we were absolutely beyond lucky being able to shoot in the Alcazar. We realised that there's nowhere on earth that looks more like the water gardens than the royal gardens at the Alcazar. The water gardens is a palace where the, the princes of Dorne have had a residence. The first time I walked on here, it did take my breath away. It was absolutely lovely. It was Dorne when we scouted it. It was almost as if we had made the costumes off of the colors. Well, it's not a set, it's a real palace. I mean, it's not a set. That's what's so extraordinary about our set. It's tremendous. Many people have asked to shoot here in the past and nobody's been allowed. This place is very difficult to shoot because it's protected by the UNESCO. I've tried in other times and it's been no possible. It was an easy process once we gained their trust and that we treated it with respect. Although we haven't had to create very much there because it existed and it's one of the most beautiful places I've ever filmed in, we're kind of adding little accents of colour in just to, just to try and emphasise the differences between the worlds. So orange colours that I think you'll probably see a lot in the costumes but also in the flowers that we've put in. The tiling that we recreated in the balcony was based on patterns that existed in other parts of the Alcazar but we did our own versions that incorporated the sunflower. There's a real vibrancy and energy about the place and the plants and everything is just so much more exotic than anything else we've seen before. For us, the idea of having the Dornish royalty living in this fantastic palace with the gardens surrounding them all sides seemed the perfect place to have this very sensual, uh, luxury-loving group of people. And we're just incredibly grateful to the Spanish government for letting us shoot in truly one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen. The thing that was really interesting about the Osuna bullring as opposed to any other bullring that we sort of managed to source was that in a sense it was just very plain. It had sort of the stone bleachers and what that meant was it really had a fantastic relationship automatically with marine. So being able to work with a, what was essentially quite a blank palette meant that it had a very close relationship to the sort of the architectural language that we'd already established. And I also enjoyed the very big pillars at the side with the angles on them, which related to the pyramidal style architecture we'd already used. And what we had to design there was a royal box for Danny and her guys to be in. And what that meant was we were able to do a completely clean build out in that arena there. It was a completely different style of construction. It was a full-on building site for weeks, and it's just a function of this show because we're doing so much at once is phenomenal. So it was something that, um, from my perspective, I've never seen done before. Well, who are you then? No one. And that is who we're going to become.
This season's one of the biggest in terms of new sets, and House of Black and White, where Arya spends a lot of time in Bravos, is one of those locations from the books we we're always excited to get to. And there's been loads of new sets built specifically for Arya's storyline, which is really, really cool. The exterior of the House in Black and White is in uh, Dubrovnik, uh, right on the water. That location was amazing. We were literally right on the water's edge, and the set that they built was huge. Falamogulis. The black and white doors were described as being 12 feet tall. They were always to be very rectangular. What was wonderful about them was to see Aria next to those doors. For the exterior that we actually built out in Croatia, we created a facade that, from my perspective, was faceless. I didn't want it to give away at all what was housed inside. She first enters into the atrium, which is very high ceilinged and in this weird oval shape, and the perimeter of it is surrounded by different gods. The House of Black and White is a repository of the thousands of gods that have ever been worshipped throughout all the lands that we visit in Game of Thrones, and Deb took that idea and ran with it. It was a huge challenge for Deb Riley and her team. I just thought she did such beautiful work on each one of the different gods that people come to pray to and the way that they were arranged in the space and the way they defined the space and the gorgeous, creepy, dark pool in the middle of the room. And what the room tries to do is to remain neutral enough that these sculptures can sit there and each have the same level of importance. It's one thing to describe a place on paper and quite another for Deb and her team to actually build the place that's going to provide that atmosphere for the viewers. And you just want to write more and more scenes for those locations. It's a combination of set piece by the art department in CG that extends to its full super height. It just needed to be ancient and huge, like you were in a giant, giant cave where there's no windows, there's no natural light, and some candles on the floor. So it's also a little bit disorienting. The iron door ultimately leads to the corpse washing room, where the corpses are taken and, and then prepared. Similar to a morgue, we have a big slab of stone where the body would be placed and Arya has to learn how the body is prepared. Once people are dead, their faces get taken from them and um, put up for further use. So with the Hall of Faces, there was always a big question as to how much of this space would be practical and how much of it would be in visual effects. And we wanted it to be mystical and creepy, but at the same time feel like an actual space. These faces are somehow stored but also part of the architecture. We've built approximately uh, 600 phases. We've tried to have a mix of as many different sort of races and ages, face shapes and sizes as possible. Done a few on the team, so we've got David and Dan in there. One face that uh, Aria is touching, it's actually turned out to be my mum. She was delighted. She's like, my God, I'm gonna tell everybody I'm in Game of Thrones. It's the most impressive set that I've been into, but that's not even all of it. It goes on for pillars and pillars and pillars and goes up for meters and meters. Largely, whichever direction you look, it's giant pillars covered in faces, like a hall of mirrors in that way. It's disorienting because it's so the same in all directions and it's so big. Seeing all of those eyeless faces looking at you when you walk down those columns, I think it really helps the actors get into the, the scene to be in the middle of something that is as, as deeply weird and, and wonderful as the Hall of Faces. What was that? When people start to uh, succumb to grayscale, they're taken off to Valeria because no one else lives there. Valeria was a complete invention from the bottom up. You have descriptions from the book and from the script, but you have a lot of opportunity to create something special and something new. What we were able to do is build our polystyrene elements onto that existing bridge as though the stone men were within an arch of this much larger aqueduct. And what it meant was that Tyrion and Jorah were able to be on a boat traveling down this river and past the stone men in real time. There's a disused swimming pool, which we're converting into a water tank, and we're gonna hold Peter in the water, and then one of my stunt guys is gonna be weighted and on the bottom, and he grabs his ankle, and he struggles, and then that's the last thing we see. It was a very complex sequence to kind of figure out exactly how to treat it and how to make it work. And it was, it was really, it was one of the most all hands on deck sequences that, that we had to shoot.
The fantastic thing about the Hard Home set is we're building something that is so far north this time that what we get to do is create a fishing village that is exactly as the name describes. It's Hard Home. What we've been doing both in concepts and in models is looking at the location out in Magramorn and created what we need for the action, which is a longhouse in which a lot of action takes place. And then we have the landing area, which we're able to use the lake that exists in Magramorn. And so through having those sort of necessary requirements, we can then build this sort of tent city that uh, will be created out there. It's difficult to build a large scale settlement that looks old and lived in and worn down by the elements. One of our most successful sets was Castle Black and has served us really well over the years. It is so successful because it has that 360 degree lived in quality. The scripted activity was just too great to take the show on the road. So we had a template for what it should look like. And we will shoot backgrounds in Iceland that will extend this set. So this set will exist in a place in Iceland when you see the final product. We're going to match this up with a 3D model scan in uh, Iceland, so the two get blended together. We have these opticopters that fly over and take photographs and stuff, the tiny little things, you know, like the little drones, I think, and they just fly over and they take photographs, and from the digital data from the photograph, you extrapolate a 3D model from it. Castle Black already exists within that quarry, and so it eventually ended up being the perfect spot right on this existing lake. Hard home, just by its very name, should be a tough environment. So it was just a matter of turning this location and winterizing it into an austere volcanic black beach. We were wanting something that was particular to the hard home space itself. And what that meant was our guys were able to take, you know, skins and branches and pieces of timber and things that would have been found and create these little dwellings out of them. And instead of there being a consistency amongst them all, there was also a feeling that each of them was quite separate and individual, that they had been made by the people who were actually sheltering there. And there was a lot of sketches being done, a lot of reference in different kind of enclosures and encampments around the world and looking at different kind of places where refugees would be. We were looking for a different building style than we had used before. So we were looking at very sort of Nordic um, construction. And what that meant was that we were able to establish a building style in the huts that we hadn't seen before on Game of Thrones, with the beautiful grass roofs, for instance. We're supposed to just feel a little bit more thrown together and repaired and older, and I mean, the docks are a little bit rougher. This is where full credit needs to go to Tom Martin, the construction manager. Uh, he is an absolute genius at finding reclaimed timber, and that timber is 100 years old, I think. It's all real timber, and uh, it was it was also quite a challenge for construction to get these materials, um, because the whole turnaround was so sudden. The art department and construction have done a really great job of turning what was a notion into reality. Everything had to be positioned by machinery because it was massive. We build it for real because the action is for real. To think it was built for one episode. I mean, you know, most of these sets, they're built for many, many episodes. Hard Home is kind of special because it's an exterior set and it's built really for about 20 minutes of one episode. First time I walked on set, I was, and I mean this in the best sense ever, humbled by just the scale of it and the dedication everybody has to uh, to make this look fantastic. Deb Riley has done such an amazing job of creating, conveying a sense of desperation with the Hard Home set. You sense the plight of these people as soon as you see the conditions to which they've been reduced to living. Jon Snow's come to this place not knowing what to expect, and uh, I think it must be incredibly shocking to land in this environment.